wake up so early. It seems that some of you are still uh, sleeping this morning, but they will, they will wake up in a minute. Ladies, gentlemen, very welcome at the Vleric Business School for our EUI Front School Forum in European Energy and Climate Policy. I am Professor Glachon, the director of the Front School of Regulation, and I will immediately give the floor to my president, the president of EUI, Professor Weiler, for a more comprehensive welcome. Joe, the floor is yours. You should use the microphone this way, yeah. This one? Thank you very much. My name is Joseph Weiler. I'm the president of the European University Institute. They allocated exactly uh, five minutes. I don't think I'll use more than three. Uh, a word about the European University Institute. We breathe with two lungs. One of our missions is educational. Uh, we do not do undergraduate, we do not do masters, we do exclusively doctoral and postdoctoral training and study and research. Uh, our mission in life in that respect is to train future professors uh, for Europe. We are reasonably successful. 70% of our doctoral graduates are professors in various universities in Europe. I don't think there's any university in the European Union that has that kind of placement rate. And when it comes to our law department, our economics department, about half our doctoral students are not interested in going to academia. They want to practice as economists. And also there, we are reasonably successful uh, the largest group of economists working at the European Central Bank are graduates of the European University Institute. I could go on and on, but there are limits even to immodesty. Uh, our second lung, our second function, is represented by the Florence School of Regulation. Uh, it's a shining example of that, I would say. It's policy-oriented research under the auspices of our Robert Schumann Center of exactly the kind of type that you see here. Uh, there, we provide high-level training and uh, create the context, uh, gather the information, the strands of thinking to put together high-level fora such as this with the policymakers. We don't do the policy ourselves. We are not policymakers, but we provide the context in which that kind of informed discussion can take place. We do this in this field of regulation, energy, climate. We have a very successful migration policy center, uh, global governance, and various activities of that sort. In that way, we try to combine uh, both aspects of what I think is a modern way of doing university studies. I wish you a very successful uh, day. Uh, productive and also enjoyable. Thank you very much. Thank Welcome. you, Joe. So I'm taking back the floor. What is the idea of the day? The day is made of three halves. I know it makes a lot, but I am French. If you remember the three musketeers, they were four. Athos, Porthos, Aramis, D'Artagnan. Today you will have three halves. The first half we are in. It is European energy policy. Second half this afternoon, European climate policy. Third half, the evening, increasing transparency in energy markets. You know as much as me that transparency and even integrity of markets are really something of value in the energy sector and of course in many other sectors. So I am back to the first half. You have all the details in this wonderful tiny booklet, but I will remember you the structure. We start with an introduction from the commissioner. It is, it is the case of the morning and in the afternoon. Just after that, we have a round table or a panel, depending the word you prefer. This morning, this panel is chaired by Michael Skapinker, being, uh, being, being there. there. 
business columnist at Financial Times. And you will see that um, this uh, panel is assembling uh, top uh, company managers around the director general, Philippe Lowe. Philippe is late, as you can see. But not only Philippe is late, the commissioner himself is so late that he won't make it. But he did send us the person at his cabinet responsible for retail market. So in fact, we will get the speech writer. And the speech writer will read his own speech. So no excuse not to deliver, Mark. <laughs> Mark Van Stiput will be the lecturer introducing the day. And I do not know if you know that if you go to YouTube on the Fruon School series of video lectures, you will see that Mark is also a lecturer at YouTube Fruon School. He's not the only one, but he's one of us, and we are very proud of this. We are a knowledge platform, so we are open to all uh, people having valuable uh, knowledge to deliver. I have only one thing more to say. Uh, the last thing is that it is a forum, so it is open. It is an open debate. It's not a cloth shop. It's not a Chatham house. You say what you think, but you cannot impede your colleague to repeat it to his company or family two minutes after. And even, even, even 10 seconds later, because we are going to tweet, that's totally new for me. I am 64 years old. I'm going to tweet. We will see if, if tweeting enlarges the audience and reach the debate. That's, that's a novelty. And, and we hope that novelty will work with you and, and for the others, the, the, the ones still sleeping. There is 150 uh, people uh, already registered for the conference, and we have exactly one seat for every person. Mark, you have the floor and our attention. Use the microphone like me, because I've been told that's the only way to make it work. Use that one. Can I put it in here, or? Good morning. Everybody can hear me. So thank you, Mr. Glashon. Thank you, Mr. Weiler. Ladies and gentlemen, um, so it's with much regret that uh, Commissioner Oettinger is not able to take part in this forum today uh, to personally reiterate his thoughts on energy and climate uh, policy, and in particular on the importance of the retail market. Uh, which is essential and necessary for the provision of sustainable, secure, and competitive supply to the EU's consumers. So on Commissioner Oettinger's behalf, I would like to thank the European University Institute, the Florence School of Regulation, and the Financial Times for bringing together leading policymakers, business leaders, regulators, academics, to discuss the future of retail markets in Europe here today. I think this is an important and well-timed debate. The Commission is currently discussing what energy and climate policy should look like after 2020. Obviously, this is very important work. Uh, but since you will have the whole afternoon to discuss this further, I will focus uh, on the topic of this morning, namely bringing innovation into retail energy markets. Because even if many discussions these days focus on 2030 long-term investment goals. Also for 2020, we are not in a safe harbor yet. We are on track to reach our CO2 emission targets. Uh, we are on track to reach the renewable targets for 2020. Uh, and some member states are even ahead of their national targets. But we risk moving backwards when it comes to reaching these objectives in the most cost-effective way. Renewable support schemes are national and to deal with this uh, worries of system stability because of the increased amount of renewables, many member states also look for national solutions to ensure uninterrupted supply. On November the 5th, the Commission published a communication on public interventions that basically contained two messages. 
First one is don't look for purely national solutions, but make use of the internal market to meet your renewable targets and to, meet, to maintain secure supplies. And the second, look at cheaper alternatives before you develop national solutions to deal with capacity worries. One of the cheaper alternatives that we highlighted in that communication is demand response. Some studies estimate that the volume of controllable load in the EU is at least 60 gigawatt and say that it has the potential to save over 4 billion euros per year. Uh, we estimate that currently only 10% of this potential is used. Uh, last week, um, for example, TNO uh, in the Netherlands said that their study shows that middle-sized companies such as uh, cold store facilities, so the energy-intensive mid-sized companies, can save 40% of their energy costs by making their consumption respond to wholesale market prices. Much of the unused potential for demand response is with customers connected to the distribution grid. At the same time, more and more electricity is produced locally. In Italy, the share of solar PV in the first seven months of this year was 7.3%, and in Germany, it was over 2012, 5.3%. As subsidies decrease, but the price of PV goes down, it's hard to say at what percentage this will stabilize. It's clear, however, that small-scale production from solar PV makes a major contribution to electricity production from renewables, and that the local grids need to be able to deal with a large variation in input that comes with it. Last but not least, almost all member states have smart grid rollout plans, according to which 73% of the EU's households will have a smart meter by 2020. <coughs> with a much more detailed and instant measurement and management possibilities, this provides, the potential for demand response, as well as local grid management, can be developed. But just replacing the old electromechanical induction meter by a digital meter is not sufficient. If we want to make sure that these, let's say, new technologies are deployed in a way that actually, actually promotes innovation and innovative services, innovative system management that benefits the consumers, we need more than just a fancy box on the wall. We need to organize a retail market so that it promotes innovation. Today's forum is an opportunity for us to address the challenges for the future of retail markets in Europe. What is needed so that we can fully exploit the potential of demand response, local electricity generation from renewables, energy efficiency? I think that there are four, five issues to address. First of all, encouraging changes in consumer behavior and consumers' involvement requires the removal of regulated prices. This should not impede the design of a system that effectively protects the most vulnerable consumers. But an innovative retail market starts with consumer empowerment. Only well-informed and confident consumers can keep energy prices in check by actively choosing the most suitable supplier and offer. And such offers need to reward consumers if they adopt their consumption to the price signals. So secondly, we need dynamic pricing. We need billing systems that charge consumers on what they use and when they use it. As long as the meter is only read out once every two years, and the energy you actually used at 8 o'clock this morning or will use at 8 o'clock this evening, when I suppose you will be at the Transparency Award Ceremony, is based on generalized consumption that applies to all other households in your country. And I think tonight most of them will probably be watching Champions League football on big screens that use lots of energy. So you can shift your consumption away from peak hours as much as you want, but it won't make a difference. So instead of being able to bill separately for consumption during the day and during the night, what is in many places possible now, we need billing systems that are able to bill you for every quarter of an hour of the year. And I hope that tonight, or maybe next year, the transparency award will go to somebody who will actually award you for being at the ceremony. Thirdly, there will be a huge increase of data traffic 
data from the smart meter, demand response signals, data on local production, and on the one hand, data and protection and privacy must be ensured, as well as the protection of the system against cyber attacks. <coughs> but on the other hand, this data is needed for innovation. How should this happen? If the innovation in the retail market will depend more on data management than on electricity production and consumption, is it then the electricity companies that are in pole position, or is it rather telecom operators or the internet companies? If the metering data is available via internet and the appliances are connected via the internet of things, does that mean that internet providers will also offer energy services? This brings me to the fourth point, the central role of DSOs. In many countries, DSOs have been the driving force behind many smart grid projects, offering new services to consumers. An innovative retail market should allow DSOs to optimize grid investment. In many member states, the distribution tariff is a big factor in the overall energy cost for the supplier or for the consumer. And regulators have a big responsibility to ensure that tariffs are set correctly and that DSOs invest in smarter grids in an efficient way. But does that mean they should also have a role in balancing or should that only be for the TSO? What are the minimum and the maximum tasks of a DSO? In the THING project, uh, the Florence School of Regulation has actually provided valuable insights into these questions. Last but not least, I have focused mainly on the electric electricity system, but it's clear that at the local level, we cannot look at electricity in isolation. A house needs electricity and heating, and making the retail market more sustainable and efficient means that we need to make sure that the, at the local level, all the different uses of energy are optimized in an integrated way. And if the market develops beyond that, then policy needs to address it. If I mention transport, you will probably think of electric vehicles and their interaction with the electricity system. But yesterday, I actually heard a commercial of a Belgian company that offered a single supply contract that included gas, electricity, petrol, and mazout. So this is not to say that innovation is automatically more sustainable. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the local networks are becoming increasingly important in the European energy system. And to exploit its potential, we need an innovative retail market. I welcome today's discussion as an important contribution to provide policy answers that will help us to develop an innovative retail market. And when I say us, I mean all of us involved. Member states, regulators, suppliers, aggregators, TSOs, DSOs, consumers, newspapers, think tanks, universities. So I wish you an interesting debate. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mark, for this uh, excellent opening. And thank you for the commissioner for the ex excellent opening. It shows that we have many changes in front of us. It's sure also that uh, smart meters are only a key on the door, but doesn't tell what is inside the room. That's what we will discover uh, together. <laughs> and it's also true that for DSOs, this new world is really, really at, at the core of their activity, and they are on the first line to, to look at it and to discuss it. But of course, all the other suppliers too. What else to be said? But maybe I can come back to the day itself. Um, this day is made in partnership. You are at the Vlerik Business School, being a leading Belgian business school. And it's not uh, an accident. Uh, we are a school of regulation. We are not really good at business, business affairs, balance sheet, results, investments, and the like. So we did think that it was a good thing to associate with, uh, with a business force, a business knowledge team, being a very business school. Uh, second, we are also in association with Financial Times. I won't introduce you Financial Times, but only the word we detect from Financial Times, a knowledge partner. We have academic knowledge, of course, yes, uh, true, but we need also the knowledge of the world of practice. That's exactly what the Financial Times is bringing to us and to you. 
And we have, um, uh, we got fuel for the day from uh, distinguished donors, Elia, from Belgium. Gaz de France Suez, being from many countries, so I won't give any, uh, being afraid of forgetting one or the other. And Ren, being the Portuguese TSO, I can also try to say it in Portuguese, but I do not promise. It's something like Redes Energeticas Nacionais. <laughs> I did my best, but I, I thank you uh, with the deepness of my heart. And now we are going to enter the panel. Uh, we are unlucky because Philippe is not there yet, so you are going to cross, like me, your fingers and toes. But he did promise to join. So I will uh, give the floor to uh, Michael. Michael will run the panel his way, so we will explain you what his way is made of. And I uh, gently ask uh, Gunther Mark and J Joseph Joe to sit where they want. And they will be replaced by Simone Emory and Grégoire Pouguillaume. If you want to sit, you're welcome. And you should use the microphone the same way like me. And, and not to believe that uh, this uh, device will, will work. So, um, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, uh, Jean-Michel, for the introduction. Um, uh, as Jean-Michel said, my name is uh, Michael Skopinka. I'm a columnist on the Financial Times and uh, also the editor of the uh, FT Special Reports, which are these reports, as you see, not by coincidence. Our report today is on European energy. Uh, we also have reports uh, today on Kenya on its 50th birthday. A happy birthday to Kenya. And also one on uh, a series that we call the new trade routes between the Middle East and Africa. Um, so these are very good briefing documents, as I found when I was uh, preparing on the Eurostar for today's event. Um, I'm pleased to introduce our panel, um, starting at uh, this side uh, is uh, uh, Christian Bouchel who is the uh, deputy CEO of uh, RDF. Uh, next to um, Christian, we will have, when uh, he arrives, Philip Lowe. Um, Philip Lowe, uh, I'm sure, as many of you know, is a very experienced and uh, long-standing uh, official of the European Commission. He's the director general of uh, DG Energy. And, uh, I first got to know him many years ago when he was uh, the uh, chef de cabinet of uh, Neil Kinnock's office uh, in transport. Uh, and I was then the uh, Financial Times uh, aviation correspondent. So we'll be um, welcoming um, Philip when he arrives. Uh, right next to me is uh, Oisten Lozef, who is the CEO and president of uh, Vattenfall. Um, on my uh, left, we have Simone Mori, who is uh, Executive Vice President of uh, NL Holding. And uh, next to uh, Simone is uh, Grégoire Pouguillon, who is the uh, President of Alstom Grid and uh, Executive Vice President of Alstom. Now, our um, subject today is uh, bringing innovation into uh, retail energy markets. Um, we will start with that, but I'm sure given the experience and the expert knowledge that we have on this panel that our discussion will range and go very widely. Now, what I plan to do is to ask each of the members <laughs> of the panel to make a short two-minute presentation on what they think the most important issues are in bringing innovation into retail energy markets. Uh, we will then have a discussion uh, on the panel and I will then uh, open the discussion to the floor so that all of you can participate. So, 
if we can begin with uh, you, Christian, if you would like to tell us what you think it takes to bring innovation to the retail energy markets. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, very happy to, to be on, on this table. Perhaps to precise uh, also, uh, Michel, that uh, I try to represent uh, the European DSOs because we are so convinced what uh, Mark was saying, that uh, DSOs has a, a special role in the, in the coming years to uh, implement new markets uh, on the grid. We have created uh, a European association to discuss with the Commission and uh, different uh, stakeholders, uh, an association called uh, EDSO for Smart Grids. And uh, uh, I have in charge, uh, as a vice chairman of this association, trying to, to build up uh, our, our view of uh, what is uh, good to, uh, to, to, to build this new world uh, we, we need uh, in the energy. So I try also to represent the other DSOs, not only uh, ARDF, uh, which is the, the, the main di uh, distributor uh, in, in France. So your question, uh, if I understand right, is uh, bringing innovation into retail market, how we can do it. I think at least we, we should uh, discuss on three issues. The first one is uh, empowering the customer. At the end of the day, the customer has to decide how he manages his energy, uh, how much he's uh, willing to pay for, and so on. So empowering the customer is in the center from our point of view of... Um, is Philippe Lo, I... So I have been coming very... Hello. Should I introduce Mr. Philip Lowe? Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, so the, the, the first point, uh, empowering the, the customer. The second one, which is uh, very important for us as distributors, uh, and I, I guess the suppliers here in, in, in the room are waiting for, for, for strategic movement on, on this issue, is uh, bringing uh, to the electricity market new possibilities. Uh, new pos possibilities in offers uh, from uh, suppliers, uh, from aggregators, from uh, curtain uh, um, uh, players. And uh, these offers has to, to contribute to the EU political goals. And the third, uh, the third uh, I think, uh, way to, to implement uh, this innovation on retail markets is, um, is our main challenge, in fact, that as uh, DSOs, is to handle with the technical issues uh, on the grid side, and I can tell you that uh, these issues are not so easy and uh, uh, there are absolutely uh, a necessity to do it. Uh, let me uh, perhaps begin with the last one, uh, the, the technical issues. Uh, it's, not, it's, not every, it's not so known that uh, mainly the renewables are connected to the distribution grid, yes? We, we connect uh, we connect uh, renewables all over Europe. Uh, Mark uh, gave us some, some figures uh, in different countries and on, a, on an average level in, in the Europe. Uh, in France, a, a decade ago, we had approximately uh, no renewables on, on, the, on the distribution grid. Ten years later, uh, we have uh, more than 1,000 uh, windmill installation uh, equal to six, seven gigawatts. Uh, 260,000 PV uh, installation connected on, on the grid for 3.2 uh, gigawatts. And uh, uh, more and more uh, we connected uh, this PV. Uh, as a former uh, CEO uh, and, and member of the board of ENBW in, in, in Germany, uh, the, the, the player in the south of, of Germany, uh, I'm um, or can I put it? I'm totally aware that uh, these kind of figures can reach uh, other summits, yes, uh, that we have in France. And so, what what is in what is the, the, the this reality, this technical reality, uh, affect our organization? Why? Uh, because these these renewables are mainly connected on the distribution grid. I insist on this point. In France, for example, it's more than 90 percent of the renewables are connected to the distribution grid. And to be more precise, it's not only on the distribution grid, it's on the low voltage uh, grid. So um, in, in, in most countries, uh, it's the same in the United States. We have developed in, in the last decades uh, a lot of uh, smart uh, tools uh, on, on the medium volt, voltage uh, grid. We have sensors, we have remote possibilities on the medium voltage grid. 
but our our low voltage grid is uh, is unfortunately very uh, uh, it's it's only a top down grid yes and and so uh, the this the, the main issue to implement innovative things on on the grid is to develop the low voltage grid which was not absolutely not built for 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 this issue if we, it's, it's amazing, uh, only to give a, an example, it's, it's rather amazing in, in 2013 uh, that uh, if there is a disruption uh, on, on the grid, uh, the customer have to, has to ring us uh, as distributor to be aware that there is a, a cutting, yes? So the, in, the intelligence and the smart on the low voltage grid is yet, unfortunately, not uh, uh, on the table. Second, the second uh, thing we try to do uh, to, to implement more innovative possibilities uh, on, on the retail markets, uh, it has been said uh, by, by Mark, is to, um, to have demonstrators. We have, uh, uh, through our association, uh, European Association, we have a lot of demonstrators uh, all over Europe. Each country has its own uh, plan to, to develop uh, new demonstrators. Uh, to give an example in France, this is more than a, a demonstrator. The, uh, we are currently pre preparing uh, the, the large uh, scale rollout of, of the smart meter Linky. Uh, as you know, it's based on a PLC uh, te technology. Uh, it had taken a, a long time to, to, to make this decision. Uh, the previous government was very active on, on, on this issue, uh, and now it has been decided. The, the rollout of all for all uh, the 35 million uh, customers. So, I, I think it's one of the, the in the world uh, in, in in terms of number of meters installed, the the, the biggest uh, project. Uh, the public tender has now been launched for the fir the, f the the first three million uh, uh, meters. So, uh, this this uh, generally speaking, the smart meters. Uh, Jean-Michel said it's only uh, a first step, yes, but to, to make the second one, you, you need the first step, yes, and it's not so easy. We see in a lot of countries uh, all over Europe, the decision, the directive says you have to do it, but yet the uh, decision has not been made. I, I have passed two minutes, so one minute, uh, and, and so this is an example. The second one, I, I pass, uh, you know, we have a lot of experiments all over Europe. The third, the third way we have to to, to, to go uh, to implement uh, more innovative uh, things, I think it's uh, to, to play, uh, we as DSOs, uh, a clear role as neutral, absolutely neutral market enabler. Uh, we, have, we have to do large investment to, uh, to connect the, the renewables, but this investment definitely has, has to contribute uh, to the emergence of new markets in terms of uh, uh, prosumers, possibilities, uh, suppliers, aggregator can propose new offers. It was speaking about uh, dynamic tariffs and so on. And uh, I conclude with this, we, I hope we come later on. To implement all of this, we have to invest a lot of money in DSOs. Uh, only in France, in the 10 coming years, we have to invest uh, approximately one, 100 billion euros. We invest, we as ERDF, 3 billion euros a year. We need a regulation uh, who help us to invest in this, uh, in this grid. Thank you very much, and I come back later on. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Christian. And as you say, we will have uh, an opportunity to come back to these issues. Um, Philip, uh, you've uh, just arrived. Welcome. And uh, right. as you're a very experienced operator, I was just uh, commenting to the audience mm. before you arrived how long ago it was, I think, that we first came across each other. Um, I think you... In the sky, I think. <laughs> yes, exactly. I think uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep to our order. So if you could um, uh, spend just uh, two to three minutes talking to us about, uh, from your point of view, uh, what we need to see for uh, innovation in the retail energy <coughs> markets. Well, thank you very much, um, Michael, and um, apologies for two things. For One is for having to attend at short notice a meeting between Connie Hedegaard and uh, Gunther Oettinger. And the second, because I've lost my voice. <laughs> <laughs> and I probably will lose it. Um, however, uh, that being said, uh, and um, with a lot of deference to what I know Mark has already uh, explained to you, um, I think uh, everyone is excited by the idea of uh, retail energy markets taking off through intelligent systems. 
Um, but somehow, we don't actually yet seem to get there. And if you look at, um, if you read the third package uh, directives on rollout of sm smart meters, I mean, it, it's very nice. It is, uh, we will strive to, well, carry out cost-benefit analyses of smart meters, and then eventually by 2025, or whatever the date is, I can't remember now, we'll do it. Um, and there were also uh, there was also a lot of uh, deference in the in the third package uh, legislation to um, the idea of uh, empowering consumers, transparency, billing, etc. And we we backed that up in the energy efficiency directive with similar um, prescriptions. Um, I want to just uh, instead of going over old ground because. We have legislation there which seems to go in the direction which uh, Christian was talking as well. Nevertheless, um, how do we get th this dynamic of competition through innovation going in retail markets? And the, uh, sorry, <coughs> and the, um, I'll have to eat it actually, I think. Um, uh, the, the answer surely is that markets only work with the availability of information to actual and potential stakeholders. That is to say, both on the supplier side, but also on the consumer side, businesses, large, small, and households, need to have the capacity to get information and to, and to use it to make informed choices about how they use energy. It's funny, we've got this expression in, in um, in um, the energy industry called demand response. Um, I, I think if you talk to anyone else in any other sector of the economy about demand response, they say, what? You, what that's what you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> it's consumer focus. It's um, not, not saying, uh, listen, if we can't provide you with all the energy every day at the same price, we could provide you with a, a little more at this time at a lower cost. That's a kind of supplier-oriented supply demand response. But a consumer focus in a normal market is that both sides have a, there's some sim symmetry of information available. And also, there's information available to aggregators, to those who think that they can offer services um, to consumers alongside the services of energy supply. And one would expect, as it has happened in other markets, in particular in the in media markets, where services are combined with the capacity to connect, uh, that the sim similar development will happen in retail markets. Um, now, I think it's fair to say that there's a considerable amount of dissatisfaction across Europe that when we say that we've brought competition into the wholesale markets in energy, um, somehow that doesn't trickle down to, um, to the, the level of the ordinary consumer for two reasons. One is actually the price of energy, the final retail price of energy, <laughs> contains a lot of non-energy elements. <laughs> And not even not not um, um, not even just the infrastructure elements, um, the element of tax, the element of <laughs> other levies, and that's uh, a constraint. But at the same time, if you ask any of us, and as consumers, and I'm a consumer of EDF in England, I'm a consumer of Electrobel in Belgium, uh, how I would make an informed choice about my energy use. And that's a household. All the surveys show that the small businesses are equally as insensitive to information about their, con their, their consumption as uh, individuals are. And um, it is the capacity to get information which actually shows you that you are able to make a choice. Now, does that depend on smart meter rollout. I would throw down the challenge <laughs> to my panel members that 
that will, of course, be hugely important in terms of a comprehensive um, um, availability of uh, data, but it would be big data on either side, big, big data. And who is going to, to make sense of it, like Nielsen's or, or Google's or, or Amazon's make sense of it for, the, for their own purposes? Um, surely we've got to find uh, uh, some new model uh, which may depend on legislation, but uh, hopefully not, where it is possible for, with the right protection for uh, privacy, data, data, privacy, data privacy, for <coughs> consumers large and small to be able to share their information with energy services companies and others, which may include the DSOs. Why not? should be competing as, as well for it, but um, would allow then some possibility of uh, making a choice which is uh, going to be better for you. And you know that the stories are, are myriad about switching. You know, I think there was one UK Consumer Association uh, uh, study which showed that 40% of those who switched actually paid more afterwards, you know. Um, so there's, there's a whole issue here of actually um, sort of um, filtering down, uh, filtering out the main messages from what you, what your consumption is, and then making a choice, and maybe even uh, asking someone to install you a smart meter. Why should it be simply centrally planned? Why, why couldn't we go to ERDF and say, um, so we know that you've got to do this uh, on a regulatory basis by year 2000 X but in the meantime I'd like to know how much I'm I'm paying f for and what I'm consuming and there uh, on the, uh, finally on the on the point of innovation uh, and what can happen on at the technolo technological level I think Christian is totally right there's a lot of going on in the mem member states there are at least 300 projects of smartness in grids in meters and in charging systems and there's huge amount of potential if, if only it was released. It can't be released if it's just simply related to um, uh, compartmentalized demonstration projects, in particular villages or towns. Surely, uh, if we're going to have a, an effect on, uh, on price and choice, um, we need to find a way, in, in, in conjunction with DSOs, to find, uh, to let um, innovation and competition flourish. Now, to join another point which Christian referred to, distribution grids. Uh, we, we, did a, we did a road map. I, I apologize that we did a road map because there are so many road maps around here uh, in Brussels that it's actually creating a traffic jam, um, um, let alone the flagships. <laughs> um, and if you've combined flagships and roadmaps, you need a, an amphibious vehicle to travel around um, <laughs> in, the, in the political morass of it. And so, uh, but um, uh, seriously, in that roadmap, it was quite clear that the major part of investment in infrastructure, de in infrastructure development was at the distribution level and not at the transmission level. Every, everyone bases their concepts of infrastructure development on high voltage transmission lines in relation to renewables. Sorry, yes, that's part of it. But the, perhaps the major challenge is releasing, uh, uh, un underpinning a release of dynamic in the retail markets by um, a further investment in, 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 uh, in local grids and local systems, which probably also means integrated systems, not just talking about energy, but talking about other things. So I'll stop there, Michael. Um, thank you very much, Philip. Uh, Philip, you referred to a UK Consumers Association study of consumers who changed uh, their energy suppliers. Um, I was looking at this yesterday, I can't remember the exact figures, but as you said, as I recall, the majority of consumers had not changed their energy suppliers, and the majority who had said they'd never go through such an experience again. <laughs> And I don't think it was just price. I think it was also the difficulty of changing. So perhaps we can come back to that. Um, so, Aisden, if we could have your... Uh
your views on this. Thank you, uh, Michael. Um, I have two jobs. One is uh, to be the CEO of uh, Vattenfall. Second one is to be a father, uh, a husband, and a consumer. Uh, so let me take the consumer perspective when we start talking about innovation. I think uh, a consumer would like to have um, security of supply in his deliveries of uh, energies. I think uh, many consumers today want uh, sustainable uh, deliveries. Uh, but maybe most and foremost, the affordability. Uh, so, should not be too expensive. And that brings me to the setup of the energy uh, market in Europe. Um, we are discussing 2020 targets. We are discussing now 2030 uh, targets. And um, I think it's important to decide what kind of system are we going to have in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Will we have one target for 2030, CO2? Will we have two or three or even more? We have um, discussions about uh, European policy, national policies. I think in the UK now they have 27 different subsidy systems. And if you multiply that with uh, the number of member states, you have quite a lot of subsidy systems uh, towards uh, specific uh, technologies. So it's a, it's a very complex picture. I think it's too complex, actually. And um, when you are a CEO, you are looking for easy explanations. And uh, if you're going to take decisions, you want to understand what kind of decisions you take. And for me, um, it's a question now, where uh, do we end based on the new targets? Uh, what, where do we want to be in the value chain as a company? Um, as it is today, we hear a lot of companies talking about that the margins are disappearing from the production side down in the value chain, downstream. And we are talking about a new business model where we're going to take out the margins in distribution or on the supply side. We in so I let it hang there a bit because this is um, something we can discuss further. We in Vattenfall have um, supported and tested several in innovative um, projects on the downstream side. We had something called One Ton Life. We tried to have a look at a family living in a house, smart house, um, driving an electric car. Uh, and reducing their CO2 emissions. Uh, your average CO2 emission uh, in a year per person is seven tons. And we tried to see what happens if you go to, down to one ton. And they actually almost succeeded the family that lived in the house, one and a half ton. But they were pretty thin when the whole project ended. Because you should not eat too much meat and you should not travel at all if you are going to come down to one ton. But this, this is an interesting project also to have a look at how would you like new houses to look like in the future, smart houses. We have participated in uh, developing a new car, Volvo. Vattenfall and Volvo has, uh, have um, developed uh, a new car together, a V60 hybrid. It's on the road now. Very, I've I've tried it myself, I'm driving one, and uh, it works. So we started that project 2008, took uh, four or five years, and uh, the car was on the road. So it's possible to make innovative solutions fast if you want to. We are also involved in, in smart grids, uh, looking at possibilities in Gotland, an island east of um, Stockholm, 40, 50, 60,000 uh, inhabitants uh, where we are building a lot of renewables and we're trying to to um, get that working together with the, with the grid, so-called smart grid. We are offering er energy efficiency council for households. 
We have uh, products like Energy Watch, uh, heat pumps, uh, and so on. But we are not 100% sure if you are going to make money on it. And uh, of course, for a company like us, that is also important. You're, in uh, the paper that I got, there was, uh, the, was a question about how would our organization look like in the future. Uh, Vattenfall, as many other companies are heavy on the production side, we get 80-90% of the margin from production, only 10-20% from downstream business. And um, it is challenging for a company like Vattenfall to um, further develop downstream business. Uh, and um, it's also challenging because um, uh, we are not 100% sure of the framework conditions in the future and what the value chain is going to look like. But um, we are working on the mindset. I think it's important to have a mindset where the customer is in focus and uh, being uh, just a smart energy enabler. So that's our target. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Aysten. Um, Simon, if we could move on to you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, well, the, 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 energy, the energy sector, the utilities, are, are, are clearly facing a change of paradigm. This is probably one of the most boring uh, commonplaces for the sector, but as many commonplaces, there is a lot of truth in that. Uh, there are three major drivers for that, the, the, the deployment and the availability of new technologies, the, the, the policies and regulation, in some cases good policies, in some cases bad policies, in, in other cases very bad policies, but this is a, depending on the cases. But in any case, there is, there is, there is, a, there is a, clear, a clear push for that. And then there is, there is a, new, a new customer approach, which is widely diffused around Europe, especially in the most mature markets. And, and this is what we have to focus on in order to understand what our uh, what are the perspectives of, of, of our sector and our business as utilities in the, in the retail energy markets? Uh, I think that the major, the, major, the major points of evolution for our customers are, are four. The first one, that our customers are becoming more and more market-oriented. That means, uh, it's absolutely true what, what Philip was saying. This is a difficult market. This is a very special market. But our customers are becoming more and more able to, to navigate into the dynamics of, of commercial offers and, uh, and uh, to, to, uh, to understand what is better for them and to ask, and to ask some innovation in these in this dynamics. The second, the second change is the environmental consciousness. Our customers are asking us to be, to be really deeply environmentally sustainable and active. This is not just for for, for, for the sake of greenwashing, we, we must really be, we have to be consistent. With, I mean, we have to walk the talk in terms of, in terms of investments, on portfolio, and on environmental, environmental sustainability actions. Then they are asking more and more a, a, a smart use of electricity and energy, generally speaking. They, they want to be, they, they understand much better how they may uh, save, uh, the uh, save energy not only in order to reduce their own energy bill, but also for be, uh, in order to be coherent with, with, the, with, the, with the generally environmental consciousness that I was just mentioning. And the fourth point is, is, is they tend to be more and more prosumer. In my country, in Italy, we have uh, more or less 400,000 photovoltaic panels. These have been installed in many cases by our, our customers. They asked us to connect the panel to our distribution grid. And they are selling to us the extra production. They are buying for us the, the balance of the energy. So they are, there's a part of their, of their needs. Uh, as, uh, what, what, is, what is meaning all that for, for, our, for our business model? Uh, well, I think that, that, that the first major, most important probably single point is that uh, we have to put energy efficiency, not as a side dish, but a very core of our commercial offer. This is, this is probably the first major step when we look at the retail energy market evolution. Uh, the second is that in order to be 
coherent with that move. We have to offer, we have to provide a bundle of, of services and technologies to our customers. Uh, electro technologies, heat pump, electric carts, home energy management services, and all the, all the, all the facilities needed in order to, to, to manage the domestic in the most efficient way. And then we have to provide the, the the, the enabling technologies, and this is especially the work of the SO. Oh, well, in, Italy, in Italy, we completed the deployment of, of our smart, first smart meter project more or less 10 years ago. So 30 million of Italians are used to manage smart meters, are used to manage a multi, a multi, I mean, a dynamic, a dynamic, a dynamic price profile. Now it's time to to work, to start to work at the second generation smart meters. That have to be multi-services. Probably we have to put together electricity and gas, maybe why not water. We are working together with our regulator in order to define the, 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 the best regulation and the best and the best technology for doing that. We need the bidirectional smart meters able to enact demand response activity. And of course, we have to, to, to lead the revolution of smart grids. Smart grids are, are, are a key technology in order to uh, promote efficiency and efficient demand, demand aggregation at local level and uh, enabling a, a, a better dispatching model, distributed dispatching model, which is becoming uh, more and more important in, uh, in countries such as Italy, Spain and, Spain and Germany, where there is a huge local concentration of intermittent of intermittent generation. I believe that the, the, the future is going to be very, very, very interesting for, for, for utilities. I mean, I, I believe that this is a, a, an, important, an important market to be explored. The, 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 the field is changing. The, 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 the many new players and new competitors are coming into this market. The, the convergence which, which ICT application is going to have a paramount importance. This will be really one of the key, uh, of, of, of the key uh, determinants of the evolution of, the, of competition in this market. And, and it's, it's very important also to sustain this process with a, with a consistent set of rules. I believe that, that there are exceptions around, around Europe. The, 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 the situation is not very homogeneous, but uh, what, what's, what, what's certain is that we need to sustain the evolution of the market. We don't have to fear the fact that the market is not working. The market is working fairly well. We have to fix several problems, of course. There is a problem of transparency. You know, well, energy bill is a, is, a complex, is a complex piece of paper, usually. Especially today, when, when I, there is an increasing burden related to the system cost, renewable costs, especially in several countries. I mean, in Italy and Spain, this is becoming a major part of the, of, of the, of the, of the bill. That, that, that's very hard to promote a commercial offer where you don't control a large part of the cost that you are, proposed, or that you are, you are building to your customer. The second, the second important point for regulators is to define smart and clever output regulation in order to address the new smart <coughs> investments. That's, that's very important. We don't need another wave of incentives for all new technologies, let me say. We need smart and selective, efficient technologies and uh, investments. And the last, the last point, probably, we have to work a little bit more in order to reduce the, the span of, 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 the, of, the, uh, of the protected and guaranteed pricing and, and, and the market at retail level. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Simone Gregoire. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, I'm actually the, the arms dealer on this panel. Um, Alstom builds power plants, thermal and renewable. Alstom uh, builds uh, transport systems, rail transport systems. And uh, Alstom uh, provides equipment and solutions to the grid, and this is actually the part of the business that I run. So smart grid is, uh, is very close to my heart. Um, I'm actually also a father, like, uh, like Oystein, and um, you know, I have these uh, little Franco-German brats at home, and uh, I don't know how it is for you guys, but every so often they ask me, what is it exactly you do, daddy? So I tell them, you know, well, I'm building the smart grid. You know, we do things like uh, we shave the peaks, demand response, so that you don't have to build power plants. And uh, we have this technology when uh, the train breaks, uh, the, the, when it gets to the train station, and we recuperate that energy, 
and we use that to charge the batteries of electric cars at the train station and the likes, you know, and I get all excited. And when I finish, she usually says, you know, this is really cool, Daddy. When does it start? <laughs> and uh, I think it's the main question about, uh, about the smart grid. And uh, somebody said it, I think Christian said it a bit earlier. Um, as, a, as an arms dealer, um, my, uh, my death, which is a uh, death by a thousand little cuts, is demonstrators. Everybody wants a demonstrator. I think uh, as Alstom, we're involved in 37 of them. And uh, we're demonstrating everything left and right. But actually, we're demonstrating stuff that already exists on a white scale basis. And uh, I'll try to use an example to illustrate that. Uh, Somebody asked, you know, what do we need for the smart grid to happen? Well, we need technology. I think I'll, I'll try to show that the technology exists. Uh, we need a regulation. I'll talk about the regulation. We need financial instruments, which are tied to the regulation. And then we need the buy-in of the prosumers. But uh, to illustrate this, let's talk about demand response. Uh, demand response at times when I talk to customers in Europe is, uh, is kind of a theoretical subject. Well, uh, we're one of the leaders in terms of providing systems for demand response. And uh, we have a customer in the US called PJM. PJM runs the largest market in the Northeast. It's from like Philadelphia to New Jersey. And um, the market is, uh, it's 100 gigawatts. 100 gigawatts is basically uh, the size of France in terms of energy supply. And uh, they run our demand response system and they have 15 gigawatts of demand response on the system. And uh, last summer, they shaved up they shaved off a, a 1.5 gigawatt peak in, in one order, a single order. So it actually runs and makes a bucket load of money for them, the system. My only regret is that, uh, you know, we didn't understand value-based pricing when we sold it. Otherwise, I'd be a rich man. But uh, it's, it's a, it's a large-scale system. It works, and it works wonderfully. So why doesn't it happen in Europe? Well, um, let, let's try to... What? Did I overrun my two minutes already? <laughs> all right, all right, I'll, 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 I'll keep it short. Uh, it doesn't work in Europe because uh, first thing is you need financial products. The, the, the products that are transacted over the market are, were conceived for uh, power plants. So it's like four hour slices. But as somebody said earlier, I think it was Mark, you need 15 minute slices for demand response to really happen. Why? Because if I'm a retail customer and I'm in a ret um, demand response contract with you, if you turn off my, electric my, my heating for 15 minutes in the winter, I don't really notice. If you turn it off for four hours, I'm really upset and I notice. So you need smaller slices. Uh, you need something else, which is that uh, today in a lot of countries, the threshold to transact with the operator is uh, 10 megawatts. So demand response at a retail level, if you have to do 10 megawatts, you have to have a really, really big house. So that means that you have aggregators instead. What the guys at PJM did is they lowered the threshold to a few kilowatts, and uh, suddenly they have all these retail customers that are transacting on the system. And um, you need a final thing. I'll, I'm cutting it short for the sake of Michael. Uh, final thing is, um, is demand response OPEX or CAPEX? Uh, to me, it doesn't really matter because I sell a system, but to these guys, it really matters because if it's CAPEX, then it goes into the rate base and they get a return on it. If it OPEX, it's just an additional cost that goes into their P&L. So, it's, it's not magic, it's not mysterious, technology exists, it's rolled out, but we need a few tweaks here and there, and uh, given that this is Brussels and the Florence School of Regulation, I feel I'm in the right place. Good. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all of you. Uh, I'd like now to open it up to questions, and perhaps I could just uh, start with a question to the panel. I felt really bad when I heard uh, Simone say uh, how well-informed the uh, European energy consumer has become because uh, as a consumer, I feel uh, very poorly informed. I don't feel I've really kept up. And one of the things that strikes me is how much more sophisticated and informed consumers seem to be, for example, about their mobile phone contracts than they are about their energy contracts. Uh, and as we've put consumers at the heart of all of this, I'd just like to ask each of the panelists one thing they think they or regulators could do to make energy bills and energy more transparent to consumers. You've all spoken about the problems of all the levies and tariffs and taxes that are added onto bills. But if there's one thing that could be done, what do you think it would be? Um, perhaps we could start with you, Simon. Uh, well, I, I, <laughs> thank you very much. I don't want to be misunderstood. I don't believe that they are very well informed. They are much better informed than before. <laughs> we, are, we are doing a good, a, a good job, I think. 
together as a system. And uh, I, 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 I get your point. I don't believe that, 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 that in, in, in other sectors, such as, I don't know, telecommunication or insurance and so on, they are much less influenced, <coughs> given the fundamentals of this market, which is very complicated. What we may do, we may do well, we need transparency. We need to improve our ability to, to communicate also through the, through the bill, probably. You know? in, in Italy, we, have, we, have now, we are now working on, 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 a, on a consultation process in order to improve the bill. I believe, I believe that the bill, given some very simple elements, should be a, a, a fundamental way to communicate to communicate uh, uh, pricing uh, and uh, the proper behavior in terms of energy, energy consumption, and so on. I also believe that there is a more structural uh, move which concerns, which concerns system cost. I don't, I don't understand. I mean, uh, there's, there's a, more, more as a father than, than, than as a manager. Why, why the political choices about uh, I don't know renewable, uh, renewable promotion at a nuclear disposals have to be paid according to your energy consumption. This is, seems to me very, a, very, a very tricky decision, and uh, probably, probably a, a, a shift into the, the, the general taxation system should be much more effective, and uh, this will give a big boost to the transparency and, and, and the communication in sector. Um, Philip, can <coughs> I ask you about that? This is a big issue. Uh, if, the, if the additional levies are imposed on the <coughs> additional levies are imposed on the consumer uh, rather than on the taxpayer this not only makes the bills less transparent it perhaps means that some of the poorer people <coughs> are subsidizing some of the richer people well if they if there are people who are poor energy poor <laughs> they're almost certainly poor generally as well and we, there should be measures to cover them measures to cover vulnerable consumers um, but in general just by the way, is this Chatham House rules or not? Uh, we no, said no, at no, the no, beginning no. it wasn't. Not at all. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> that's all right. Jean Michel's rules. Well, well I'm, very, I'm very pleased. <coughs> I'm very good. No, I just was going to say something even more provocative than that. <laughs> Philip, if I may say so, don't let that hold you back. No, 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 that's right. Well, actually, I remember Leon Britton saying that, uh, uh, asking the same question once. He said, and they said, oh, yes, yes, said Leon, no problem, it's, it's Chatham House. They said, oh, I'm very disappointed. I was going to say something provocative. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I was going to express, first of all, a doubt about whether regulation is the way to bring in a dynamic of competition. Um, we have it in our energy efficiency directive with the savings obligations. I have to say that both consumers and suppliers <coughs> are not ho wholly enthusiastic about the idea of obliging their customers to spend less, <laughs> given the fact that they will. Um <coughs> it's a very strange concept because, normally speaking, the way competition works is that someone else comes in and offers you the possibility to spend less on your product and, and you get a benefit from it and you switch to do that. Whereas if you have to actually say to your, your suppliers under the obligation to say, um, I'm going to save you 2% of your energy bills, that's, that's a bit alien and I'm not, sure that it's, I'm not sure that's the right system. That was the provocative thing I was going to say. But it's in our energy efficiency directive and, it's, and it, it's, it has to be that. I think the second thing I would say is <clears throat> if you talk about, and we're, we're going to present a, a report to the, to the European Council in, in February on the drivers for rise, rise, rises in costs and prices in energy. R breaking down the, uh, the retail price into the energy component at a wholesale level, the distribution level, the supply level, and the levies and taxes. Um, frankly, the public debate in all our countries about uh, rising energy prices does not reflect the things which something can be done about and th the things which can't be done about. For example, we cannot do anything in Europe about rising global prices for fossil fuels. Just get, we just get used to it. And secondly, if you're going to... <coughs> uh, uh, modernize your infrastructure, whether smart or not, uh, both at the transmission and distribution level, but also in generation, there is a payback there which is absolutely necessary. 
Uh, some of it will be in the regulated asset base, some of it will be outside of it. And um, so those are two elements of the, of the, of the, um, of the, of uh, the energy prices which we, we can't control uh, very easily, um, although we can make sure that there is a competitive tendering for, for electricity needs leading to generation investments. So that if you ask me if there is only one thing we can do, it must surely be to concentrate on this issue of opening up um, <coughs> distribution and retail to new entrants, and that can only be done by making uh, uh, consumer, uh, if, uh, consumption information available. And I, I, <coughs> I think um, what's been said by all the fathers on this panel <laughs> uh, is uh, is totally right, uh, and uh, all the all the different elements, what uh, the arms dealers are bringing in, what the <laughs> what the companies are now focusing on, is in the right direction. But we we still haven't got that free av availability of information, which will lead to um, people developing a business model when they're not already a traditional supplier. Uh, the one objection to <coughs> one one comment made frequently now is that, um, uh, and we have we have we went through the whole thing of unbundling in transmissions. Now the the the, the public debate seems to be about, oh well, we still got a lot of vertically integrated companies because they are ge generating energy, but they're also distributing and supplying it. And because the margins have got relatively low at the wholesale level, they look for more margins at the distribution and retail level. And the immediate reaction of, <coughs> of the average commentator was say, ah, yes, that's why energy bills are going up, which is not true, which is, which is certainly not true. But in order to prove that, that this it is not true, I think both the industry and we regulators have to explain more what's going on and where there is the possibility for things to be improved. And that's the area which I think should be improved. But don't worry about the, anything more. Christian, you'd like to say something? Or, no? I'm the only one who forgot to say that I'm a father. And, um, <laughs> and if one thing is to do is uh, to be aware of that uh, only one country uh, like India is uh, three times Europe. And uh, we should never forget that uh, while you are discussing about uh, regulation and, and plans for in 20 years what will happen uh, in the world, things are going very fast. Why, why do I say this? Be be because I, to give an, a concrete exam example, uh, several years ago I was CEO of a smaller utilities in, in Strasbourg, which is on, on, on the border and on the Rhine. And uh, we developed uh, uh, vehicles, electric vehicles program with Toyota. And uh, two years after, I moved on the other side of the rain, three kilometers away from Strasbourg, and we developed an uh, electric vehicle program with uh, Daimler-Benz, of course. And uh, to cross the bridge and to uh, plug you, your car, you have to change uh, the plug. How, can it, how is it possible in Europe? So if one thing is to do, I, I, I think it's really uh, to have stronger regulation in Europe, uh, please. We have 27, 28 sorry, uh, regulators in, in our countries, plus one. And I think the, the time, the time uh, is going very fast in, in, in the world. And I guess, uh, Grégoire, when you, uh, you are a global player and you, you speak about uh, United States or Asia, and uh, I know you, your company is very active on, 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 on this issue. I think we, we need a strong uh, regulation. The framework, uh, sorry, Philippe, but the framework which was built up on regulation in Europe was in the 80s, in the 90s, and the objective was competition. Well, uh, but now the objective is innovation. And uh, I think time is, is, uh, is, is coming uh, to, to think uh, on, on other objectives on, on the European regulation and to go uh, very fast on it. So uh, this is my point of view. Thank you. Um, I'll just point out, uh, we don't seem to have any mothers on the panel. Um, uh, Jean-Michel, perhaps something to uh, think about next year. We have some mothers on the panel as well as fathers. I do see one, so you're 
Okay. Um, now, I know uh, Oyston wants to say something as well, but perhaps I can bring him in when we have... Are there any questions from the floor? Uh, anything that anybody would like to suggest? Yes, over here. And uh, if you could just tell us who you are and uh, what organization you're from. Yeah, my name is Jan Mugwen. I have been a regulator for Norway since 1990. I just retired to start my own company to do consulting. I think it's uh, a question which should be underlined more strongly. It is, can you be energy efficient if you don't understand your energy bill? I think very, some has touched upon this issue about uh, what are the potential. Um, I think I initiated a project of informative building in Scandinavia more than 10 years ago. It was a great success. But it was not spill on to the single utility. Why? You answer the question. They will then be revealed that they're not cost efficient. So I think it's... Uh, a very complicated issue. One side you promote an efficiency, on the other side you make a, want to make a maximum profit. So, what can the customer find out all this? Okay. Uh, and, and and do the smart meter does it gives you other opportunities? I did not get a firm answer. Right. Thank you. Good, two good two good questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, trying to be a bit, a bit funny uh, on on the first question, I, and I should not, of course, but if you let your CEO in a company try to understand the bill, and if he doesn't or she doesn't understand it, then I am sure that they will get some focus on the on the energy bill. So that's, uh, but uh, what, what if you look at Scandinavia and Nordic countries, it's a lot of competition there. It's, uh, we sold recently our distribution grid in Finland. It was a, a completely new party that bought this grid. We have a lot of new entrance uh, suppliers that uh, comes in and wants to sell electricity to consumers. So if you look at uh, the margins, it's 1% to 2%. So it's, it's, uh, I think it's important also to talk about the different areas of Europe because we have, we have uh, sometimes in, in some areas come further than others. We have talked about an integrated market, but still in Scandinavia, it's not possible to be a Norwegian company selling uh, to end consumers in Sweden. They are trying to do this in 2014. And that's when we have an integrated market. That's when uh, I think your target was an integrated market in Europe in 2014. That's not going to happen. But the more com uh, the, the competitiveness um, or, or competitors in the market there are, the better it will get uh, also for us being sharp and more efficient and uh, consumers knowing that they are getting the right price. Thank you. Yes, question over there. Chair, thank you. Mark Johnston from the European Policy Centre. Um, to, to any and all of the panel, any or all of the panel, um, in, in your, from your point of view, do you think uh, the electricity market and electricity system should be organised as a good or as a service? Uh, I mean, constitutionally, Europe has a choice. If it's as a good, then the focus tends to be on continent-wide wholesale markets. If it were as a service, the focus would tend to be on... Uh, local um, services, customer focused, so the subject of the panel. So if I'm correct, we organize it more at the wholesale level, at the European level at present. Um, is there a case for changing that? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Very good question. Uh, very well, from your arms dealer point of view. Uh, as I said, I'm only a, a modest arms dealer and that one is almost too intelligent for me. Uh, but. Uh, the um, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, if you look at uh, if you look at the trend today, um, I'm trying. There's a term for it, but uh, whenever I talk to politicians, especially local politicians, their uh, their their deepest fantasy is to uh, reclaim the utilities for themselves. 
They want the grid, they want the electricity, they want the water, they want the waste. They're tired of these big companies that uh, send, uh, sell them uh, you know, one-size-fits-all type of uh, solutions. And, uh, and their, their fantasy is, uh, I'll reclaim all this and I'll be so much better. Now, uh, sorry? Yeah, it's very paternal, and uh, you know, you know, you know uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, uh, famous statements of uh, the, the scariest words in the English language are, uh, "I'm from government, and I'm here to help." Uh, the idea that you're going to optimize the grid by running it fully at local level doesn't work, but the idea in today's market that the grid is sort of one big structure that's uh, managed centrally with uh, a big brother that uh, defines what the developments are going to be for the next 20 years doesn't work either anymore. And, and really, the parallel is the internet. Um, you uh, you have a backbone, and uh, you have services. And um, if the system is open, then you can empower the cleverness of the services to get people excited at local level. You know, while while keeping the completely in this, um, um, uh, significant. I mean, the the the, the bedrock idea that. Uh, you can optimize at local level, but there's a moment where you're going to have to transact with the grid, and otherwise you don't have stability in the system, and it doesn't work. So I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, well, I'm not very good in semantics, so it, 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 it's, it's a, uh, but, but I, I definitely believe that, that, uh, that the process is going towards services, not only downstream, not only at retail level, because if you look, at the PNL of larger utilities, <laughs> um, including NL, in uh, several major markets in Europe, the, the margins coming from the, the, the commodities sold in the wholesale market are shrinking, and the margins coming from the services provided to the grid are increasing. Just because a large part of our conventional fleet today is just working in order to provide backup to the intermittent generation. So, in some way, there is, there is a clear trend toward, toward, toward a market which is uh, uh, organized around the provision of several services to the system and to the customers. No, no only to say, uh, I don't know if, if there is a good or a service, for sure it's a right electricity, yes, first of all. And one more time, we should have a, a global view on, on a worldwide view, yes? Uh, no electricity, no education, is no healthcare, and so on. And, and so this is why I, I said the regulation responsibility on a European level is, for me, very important, because we have to invest on all the value chain and to, be, to, to know who is shareholder of which activity is another question for me. The question is how we, we assure that investment uh, can be made. Uh, I said on the grid side we have to invest uh, until 2020, 400 billion euros, 400 billion euros. We have, we, we need to, to, to reach the, the, the financial cap capital market, yes, uh, to do it. And to do it, we, we need a, a European strong regulation. One more time. So, I, I'm not 100% sure if uh, I try to translate your question into, is, do you want the a uh, deregulated market or a regulated market? Do you want a monopoly or do you want competition? That could also be a question. Um, because when you call it service or... or uh, many people think that electricity delivery sh should be a service, either from a state or from <coughs> a municipality. And we have that discussion still. Since this, before the this 80s, we had a regulate the market, you pay the costs, uh, you did not have competition. And, well, that's uh, society have to decide, in my opinion, what they want. And uh, my opinion is that uh, it's, uh, if you have competition, uh, you make the companies, you, you make the delivery to the consumers more efficient. Uh, at the moment, in my opinion, it's, it's a complex system in every country. If you if we can create a unified European system, I, would, I think that would be great and, and where we all could compete and benefit the consumers. So, service, uh, good, right, I'll leave the last one. <coughs> um, well, first of all, um, I don't think we should underestimate the progress made. I agree for the 
a lot of things to fill in to say that we have a unified market by 2014. I think one of the aspects of that is that um, there's regulation at every level in the energy sector covering all the things which Christian referred to. Universal service, protection of vulnerable consumers. Um, we, we spent a lot of time trying to get the right, right framework for competition to come into the market. And we've had to deal with natural monopolies, hmm. which are there, and they are regulated to provide a service to, at a wholesale level to everyone else. Now, <clears throat> um, I don't think we should underestimate that progress. And I, of course, in the Commission, we would be delighted if there was one regulator rather than 28 plus Alberto Potocznik, plus <laughs> ourselves. It's, 20, it's 30, in fact. 30. It's 30. And then look at the TSOs and the DSOs. I mean, it's a massively um, complex system to get right. And um, but so I think progress has been made at a wholesale level. And I, don't, I think the distinction between a good and a service is rapidly becoming outdated because we have here markets which are starting to work. And the, what, the reason why we're having this panel is because we don't think they are working as effectively at the retail level as they are at the wholesale level. Now, to, to make them work effectively, yes, you do need things like standards for smart grids, meters, and charging systems. In fact, if you visit our building uh, here in Brussels, we had a smart metering, uh, a charging system bay um, installed uh, a year ago. And I invited my colleague, who's Director General of, of uh, Climate, to come and, and charge up his, his, his uh, Toyota uh, Prius. And of course, his socket was wrong too. <laughs> so we need that kind of regulation. But we don't need more regulation on price and on things which are actually preventing the market happening, we need regulation actually to free up what's going on. And therefore, I think we should be a bit more optimistic about this. I've, I mean, all the, all the corporate uh, representatives on this, this panel have said that things are starting to get dynamic. And we should push that. And if you want us to provide regulation to, to support even further uh, dynamic competition, we'll do it. Thank you very much, Philip. And uh, I'd like to thank um, all of our panelists. That uh, brings us to the end of our first panel session. We'll take a coffee break now, and then I believe we're going to our parallel session. So I'll leave that to Jean-Michel to explain to you. Parallel sessions, indeed. A string on deeper energy policy analysis. We will start with Klaus Dieter Borchardt being the director for internal market and Klaus Dieter will uh, discuss with us how to enable consumers, how to empower consumers, which is one of the key conclusions of this panel. And in parallel, we will get energy law. Maybe you know, maybe not, that energy law at the front school is taken very seriously. It's a really growing and extremely dynamic area at the front school, with Leon Scher being there. And and this young, small, extra dynamic girl, Malgort Sata. And we will choose the, the, what you prefer. And the first session uh, on the law side will be uh, uh, animated by Kai Spritze. I met and made my best <laughs> to deal with your name, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, you will do. Um, and you will, you will look at capacity markets, which is a kind of new public intervention. You can even go up to state aid. And uh, a few days ago, uh, DG Energy did release um, a kind of commentary of this, of this new area and how to make it useful or at least not useless. Thank you. Coffee break.